Folks, the NHL season is still uh, a few months away for the Jets, but based on the lack of activity in free agency, the uh, well, general radio silence when it comes to trades, and uh, Winnipeg's general passiveness this offseason, I think we can guess that the Jets are probably done making a lot of big moves. So what will the 2022-23 Jets potentially look like, and what might be the best lineups? We'll explore my picks for lines and see what you all think on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. Or Locked On the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thank you for choosing to make Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you enjoy what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is completely free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just really love and appreciate your support. Now, on tonight's episode, I thought it would be worth talking about, you know, the Winnipeg Jets 2022-23 lineup and what it might look like in something of a more ideal scenario. I'm not going to say that this team is great. Uh, as I kind of alluded to at the start, this, this roster as it is just really isn't good enough. And I've been saying it for weeks. Barring any really big moves and surprises, what we have is kind of what the Jets are planning to roll with. Uh, it's maybe been our central complaint that the Jets seemingly want to run it back, and why this is the case, I can only guess. I, I guess Winnipeg just really feels it can get it done with the new coaching staff and that Paul Maurice and the former assistants were the main problem with the Jets, but let's be real. I think this team lacks significant depth and, you know, that's going to be a recurring theme as we go through my ideal lines. Again, I, I put quotes on that because obviously this team has some very clear deficiencies, but I tried to create some lines that I think work around some, some of the issues and try to offer some skill upside while minimizing some of the negative defensive impacts of maybe some of the more struggling players. So we're going to start off with the forwards. Uh, the first line, I think, is probably a pretty easy one for me. I want Ehlers, Shifley, and Perfetti together. I think that this trio is very similar to what we saw when Perot was playing with this unit. Uh, we've seen different combos like Connor, Shifley, and I think Perot at one point, but I, I also remember there being Ehlers, Shifley, and Perot together. I think that one was the one that tended to get a little bit more ice time, and that combo was great. It's been a while since we've seen anything like that, though. I don't remember... Uh, the last time that it actually took the ice. But when those guys are paired together, you see dominant puck possession, great offensive creation in the slot, and the uh, general foot speed is okay enough to where you're not really worried about Winnipeg struggling to get up the ice and creating offense off the rush. Now, this combo with Ehlers uh, and Perfetti out wide, obviously Ehlers is going to be able to blaze in transition. Shifley himself is actually pretty quick. Uh, Perfetti maybe isn't as fleet of foot, but that's not really an issue with him. I think he tends to understand his lack of mobility in certain ways pretty well. Uh, if anything, really, the only stuff that he really needs to speed up on is maybe decision-making, which is only going to happen with him just getting more reps and shifts in the NHL. So that part I don't really worry about. I think, for me, Perfetti presents a particularly interesting case for Shifley because <clears throat> Obviously, Perfetti is a remarkable passer, and recently, you know, I think he's shown some serious defensive acumen in a way that maybe Shifley and Ehlers don't quite possess. Perfetti's not afraid to grind along the walls, he forces turnovers, he's a very smart player getting interior body positioning against opposing puck carriers, and it often leads to him creating turnovers, and then those turnovers become rush counters the other way. So, I really like Perfetti. I think for this unit, he brings a lot of offensive jump. He's got a great shot, and we all know that Ehlers and Shively together are just a good combo, period. So if you add another really skilled player to this unit and you kind of move Wheeler into a different role where he doesn't have to be 
uh, playing 20 plus minutes a night, trying to get up the ice constantly. I think it'll just make everyone happier and you're going to get better results from this team. Now, the second line people are going to raise a few eyebrows with. Uh, I'm going to go back to Kyle Connor and Pierre-Luc Dubois together. That's not really controversial. Those two have some interesting skill sets in interplays when you have Dubois kind of crashing the slot and Connor working around the perimeter, creating good scoring opportunities. At right wing, given the options that I've seen, I have elected to choose Christian Reichel. I think Reichel has shown very interesting flashes of skill. It's not at a level where I think you're going to be expecting like 40 plus points out of him. I think that he can be a competent space creator, a good facilitator. His passing and shooting are are solid enough. The reason that I've kind of put him here is because I looked at the rest of the other potential right-sided options, uh, plus, you know, the traditional choices like Wheeler and stuff. And I just feel like no one else is really going to be capable of being an all right four checker, somebody who's willing to grind in the corners and basically play these Vechnikov role. I think Reichel can do some of that. He's not necessarily a defensive uh, wonderkind or anything like that. I think with him, you're just looking for more uh, offensive creation and stuff, maybe a little bit of uh, you know strength on the puck, but not exactly like an extremely high end option here. The main job is just to kind of facilitate Dubois and Connor and help them out, not necessarily being the play driver and and key cog on this unit, but just somebody who can keep up and keep things moving. And I think in this respect, Reichel probably will, you know, be one of the better options and most suited players for this. I could see maybe an argument for like Jansen Harkins on his off wing, but uh, my, my thinking with Harkins and one reason that I've chosen to put him deeper in the lineup is because I just feel like Jansen does a lot of technical, you know, technical things, right? He's got the technique. He can skate into really good positions. Uh, you know, he's got a great shot. His his spatial awareness is there, but there's something that has like a disconnect in his game where it doesn't really lead to a lot of offensive production. So for that reason, I obviously like the Christian Reichel sample size is very small, but from what I've seen, it's it's good. I think in an ideal setting, obviously you would have like an actual top six winger there, but you know, barring as like a trade or some kind of a a free agent signing late into this whole cycle, say Sonny Milano, I think Reichel for me might be, I guess, the best choice for this this role. So yeah, I'd be curious to know how you feel about that. Uh, maybe you have another candidate you would like. I don't really know who else might make it out of camp. I guess there's a chance that Daniel Torgerson, if he comes over, impresses, but Torgerson really hasn't had uh, a consistent bit of ice time due to injuries and stuff. So, you know, I'm not going to really pencil him in yet. Uh, He's just getting familiar with the jet system and everything. So for the time being, let's try Reichel first. Now, I do want to get into some other lines and then the defensive pairings, of course. But before we go any further, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at BetOnline.net. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs. You can find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. But more than just online betting, you know, know, BetOnline wants to be so much more and offer you podcasts, news articles, league reviews, live scores, updates, and everything around your favorite sport. It's a huge content network. They provide you tons and tons of information, so you always stay up to date on your favorite sports, whether it's Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL hockey during the season, combat sports, esports, Uh, Of course, they've even got Triple Crown horse racing and golf coverage. No matter what sport you're into, they really do have everything. It's great. It's super convenient. Very easy to use platform. Even me, who doesn't know anything about online betting, I found navigating their website to be a breeze. They explain all the different categories and things, so you'll always stay informed. And honestly, just having all that information at your fingertips, it's super convenient and just a really pleasant experience, especially for those of you who do a lot of online betting and are looking for something that's very convenient. BetOnline really should be your first stop. And registering is super easy. Just go to betonline.net on your laptop or mobile device and get started today because BetOnline is where the game starts. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked on Winnipeg Jets. Uh, you know, this episode, we're taking a look at Winnipeg's lineups and what I would like to see them do next season with some, you know, caveats here and there that the team itself obviously has some clear deficiencies. And I've tried to work around uh, the, the perceived weaknesses as best as I can, but there are some things that I just can't really avoid. Uh, before we go any further, though, I just wanted to say again, thanks so much for making Locked on Jets your first listen of the day every day. 
Now, kind of looking at the Jets themselves, um, the top six I try to arrange into something that I think is pretty workable. It's not ideal, but I've tried to spread out the talent in a way that relatively facilitates uh, decent offense, some good transition, solid forechecking ability, and maybe a little bit of defensive work for guys like Shifley and Connor to maybe have some backup. Now, the bottom six is where things are getting a little bit dicier. The third line, I've opted for Harkins, Barron, and Wheeler. This is not a particularly ideal situation. I think that there are obviously some very clear signs of improvement here. Uh, Harkins, I've chosen, like I said, to put on this third line because I think he does have offensive upside. And I think if you play him with like Morgan Barron, maybe Barron has enough offensive skill and distribution ability to be somebody who can actually make use of Harkins. If not, you know, Wheeler is also there. Blake still got great passing. And I think if you put him in more like a third line role, it would obviously help him out uh, to not have to play so much and, you know, eat up first line minutes. But it's ultimately going to be his call. I think it's always been Blake's call unless, you know, Pomo was the one who really pushed for him to be a first liner. But I'm going to guess as the captain, as the breadwinner for the team and one of the faces of the franchise, he probably was the one who pushed to play so much. And I don't know if he would actually accept a demotion like this, uh, but bonus, you know, given the communication discussion that he had and the signs that, you know, the Jets kind of recognize at least some of the major issues with the team, maybe Blake would be willing to uh, accept a demotion. Obviously, he's got some friction with the organization as it is. They were talking about trading him. So, you know, looking at this, I, I have a hard time seeing him outside of the top six, just based on historical precedent. But if you really want to shake things up, I think a, f- a third line deployment with a competent center in Baron who can bring some, you know, offensive jump and a guy who has finishing ability, but maybe doesn't have as many other elements to the game in Harkins, you might actually have a decent combo that you can run out there uh, for some scoring minutes against softer competition. Now, the fourth line for me is probably, well, it's probably the most boring unit, I guess. Uh, it's it's Toninato, uh, Lowry, and Stenland all together. This is mostly just a shutdown defensive fourth line that you can pretty much match up against almost any unit out there. I don't really expect them to accomplish a ton. And under bonus, I would really imagine that there's a lot of neutral zone clogging. The thing with Stenland about him being maybe used at wing is that he is a little bit on the taller side. So maybe it wouldn't really work out. If you're looking for a lot of foot speed, that's not this unit. Uh, This trio is mostly just meant to be kind of like the Jets 2017-2018 team when you had a defensive fourth line that could eat minutes uh, and have some PK specialties. I think that's probably what you're looking for with this. Maybe occasionally they shovel home some goals and and points, but you're not really expecting a lot in terms of offensive production. Uh, I could easily see arguments for swapping some of these players between the third and the fourth line. I think Lowry will probably get the third line center role again, which would push Barron down to the the fourth line. And I can't really argue with that. I mean, Barron probably is best suited in a, a really depth role, but I, I've just tried to find something they get that again makes as much sense as possible. The one swap I could see is if you have um, Lowry at three C with with Wheeler, it might actually be a pretty okay combo. And then I would use maybe Stenland or or Barron down the middle on the fourth line. Uh, Barron might actually be better as a winger. I don't know for certain, but, you know, whatever the case is, I think that there is room for moving players around here as much as possible. Again, it's it's only going to have some marginal impacts at the end of the day. Uh, the bottom six is just not really good enough as constructed, but I've tried to find something again that looks at least a little bit passable because as it is right now, without any more additions or surprise players coming into camp who just sort of smoke the competition and and really work their way in uh, cough, cough, you know, Brad Lambert and a few other players like that. I, uh, I have a hard time really seeing anything coming of this roster as it is. So let me know what you think of the bottom six, uh, either in the YouTube comments below or at my social medias at HL living local and at LO underscore Winnipeg jets on Twitter. In just a moment, we'll take a look at the defense and see if there is any hope for a passable blue line and maybe even, some signs of of positive thinking for the kids. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked on Winnipeg Jets. We are, of course, taking a look at Winnipeg's uh, 
whole lineup situation for next year and trying to figure out some stuff that's what I would consider like ideal lineups. But again, like I've said throughout the episode, uh, it's working with what you've got and with what the Jets have. It's it's not a lot, right? We're we're dealing with some stuff that's not really ideal. But you know, as far as the forwards are concerned, I think that that four line unit is passable. It's not great, but it'll be enough to maybe make a wild card spot if we're lucky. The defense, I think there's maybe a little bit more reason for optimism if Bonus is interested in maybe deploying the children. Uh, I I don't think this lineup is going to be the one that he chooses, though, for a a variety of reasons. But on the first pairing, I think DeMello and Morrissey can probably be probably be seen as a lock. I can't really find any other pairings that uh, have worked as well as these two together. I think if you have an okay first pairing like this, it'll be fine. They've been uh, pretty decent together recently, and I just don't really see a reason to split them up. So I'm keeping that as my first unit. Uh, I think they bring puck mobility and defensive acumen at a level that's acceptable. The second pairing is where I'm starting to take a little bit more risk. Um, Here I've got Heinle and Schmidt, and a lot of people are going to say Heinle is not ready. He's too small. His defensive coverages are weak, and there is some truth to this, yes. Uh, With Heinle, you're not really looking for a lot of defensive acumen, though. If defensive positioning and stuff and losing your man was a discredit to somebody's qualifications for this team, half the Jets' defense would have been fired into the sun years ago. This team like has some of the worst defensive coverages and D-zone awareness that I've ever seen. And it doesn't matter who it is. It's just universal across the board. There's only a few players who have generally escaped this. And even then, you know, guys like DeMello and Morrissey, they've gotten victimized plenty of times. So I don't really view that as all that important, to be honest. What I kind of want with this pairing and what I've seen with them in very short samples is a lot of puck mobility and cycling. I think the thing that people don't get with Heinola is that when you pair him with a puck moving partner like Schmidt, who is very aggressive, who has very good skating and can get up the ice very quickly, Heinel has got amazing long passing. He can hit a cross slot pass uh, or a diagonal pass on a one touch re- reception very easily. And he does it almost without even thinking because he knows where his players and teammates are on the ice. He knows where the opposition is. And look, every now and then he will turn the puck over. That's going to happen. But Again, like I said, that's pretty par for the course with the Jets. You just kind of have to let a kid like this work through it. And I think once you start to see that really quick passing, um, those rapid receptions that become uh, zone exits and things like that, Heinle's true ability to move the puck and advance it up the ice is going to be where you get your defensive value. The less time the Jets have to spend in the defensive zone, uh, I I just think that's going to be a better outcome all around. And with bonus... I think he understands how to make the most of that. He did a really good job with Miro Heiskinen, who I think brings a somewhat similar skill set, although Heiskinen was a little bit more well-rounded defensively. You know, this pairing, again, you're not really looking for a lot of shot suppression, but what you are going to get is once they're up the ice, once they've gotten out of the neutral zone and into the offensive zone, these guys are going to be making a lot of great passes. They're going to be taking dangerous shots. And if bonus lets them be aggressive, they're going to support the forwards in a way that the Jets haven't really allowed over the past couple of years. And with how good Heinle and Schmidt are with puck possession, I just see this as a potentially really dynamite deep pairing. Uh, and Heinle himself can be really effective on like the power play. It's something that I think his skill set naturally leans towards. But you know whether or not Heinle really makes the lineup this year is going to be up to Bones. And probably during camp, we'll see what the preference is. But I really feel like he's too good to just keep let uh, keep allowing to be languishing on the bench. And, you know, with Schmidt, they've had a, a pretty solid sample so far, uh, small as it is. But there's some stuff there that I think is is really good. The second or the third pairing that I'm going to look at is Sandberg and Pionk. I don't really think this pairing is going to be great unless Pionk has a big turn turnaround in form. Uh, Neil last year was just kind of bad, and he himself said he was embarrassed with his performance, which I felt a little bit bad for him. Uh, of the guys that I would say should be embarrassed for their their performances out there, I just don't really like using that term, and I don't know that it's necessarily fair to uh, ascribe that to Neil. I think he struggled, and I think the post concussion stuff it wasn't great. But again, embarrassment no. Um, hopefully, if he rebounds in form and is at least capable of being a solid top six option, 
Sandberg's calmness and experience now with with maybe maturity and, and puck movement and, and good decision making can kind of be the stabilizing partner that Pionk needs. The problem with Neil is that he's basically been bad with just about anyone he gets paired with. So uh, if if he's not capable of recovering his form, this pairing is going to get shelled. But that's why I kind of want to make them the third pairing so that they're a little bit more sheltered and you can kind of work around that while allowing your top four to tr- you know try and run things as much as possible. Now, I, you, you probably are wondering where Brendan Dillon is. I've put him off this pairing for now uh, just because I feel like he is the most likely to get moved if any of these players are traded unless they swing for the fences and move Heinola for some really high-end forward talent. But given the uh, cap hit for Dillon, the fact that he's only got like two years left on his deal and he's on the older side, I just suspect he might be the one to get moved. But it's hard to say the Jets might roll with what they've got and I, I would definitely expect him to be in the lineup over one of Heinola or Sandberg if, in fact, he stays with the Jets for the time being. Uh, but, I mean, you know, we've got a few weeks left. Maybe there is a surprise somewhere in store for us. All I can say is I, I'm just not expecting a lot. I've tried to create something that looks at least passable. But let's be honest, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's it's trying to pull some lemonade out of a pile of stones. So let me know what you think of these lineups and what you would do yourself. Again, drop them in the YouTube comments below or at my social medias on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. Be sure to make your second listen Locked On NHL. Our experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. Stay up to date on everything in the world of hockey all at the uh, at the the click of a button on your favorite podcasting platforms, YouTube, Odyssey, Megaphone, Apple, Spotify, Google, you name it, we're on it. Give them a follow and a subscription. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great night and go Jets go.